Hello everyone. My name is Lenora Henson and I'm the Interim Deputy Director, Curator, and Director of Public Programming here at the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site. On behalf of our Board of Trustees and staff, I'd like to welcome all of you to our first Speaker Night of 2019. We're excited to kick off another season of Speaker Night, which is made possible through the generous support of MNT Bank, as well as the New York State Council on the Arts, or NISCA. In case you're new to our Speaker Night series, I should mention that NISCA's support has enabled us to record all of our speakers for the past two years. So if you've missed any of them, please check out the recordings on our YouTube channel. Speaker Night is our opportunity on the fourth Tuesday of most months to invite experts to come in and help us think about some of the issues that were important during TR's presidency and continue to be relevant today. This evening, we're fortunate to be joined by Adam Rohn, an expert on the history of our relationship with the environment. He teaches environmental history at the University of Buffalo and has written about suburban sprawl and rise of the environmental movement, the first Earth Day, and efforts to green capitalism. From 2002 to 2005, he edited the journal Environmental History. His talk tonight is called Fashion Forward, Reflections on the Environmental History of Style. With that, I'm delighted to turn the podium over to Adam. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, especially coming out on not quite as cold a night, but still a cold <laughs> night. Um, I, I've actually spoken here once before in September 2015 uh, when I was at the, on the faculty of the University of Delaware. And I, I'd never been to Buffalo before. And uh, that was in September or October, so it was a little warmer. Uh, and then the next day, actually, I went up to uh, uh, talk about fashion at Geneseo and uh, went by the lake, which I had uh, probably seen as a kid, I think, on a family vacation, but not as an adult. Uh, so, so for me, this site has karma because then it turned out um, in the next spring, my wife was offered the job as dean at the University of Buffalo of the College of Arts and Sciences, and uh, we moved here in summer of 2016. Uh, and as I was telling Lenora before, uh, of all the places that I've lived as an adult, this is my favorite. Uh, Buffalo is, is the most fun, has the most interesting history, uh, and I think it's going to have one of the most interesting futures. Uh, so it's it's a pleasure to be to be back here. Um, and and TR, um, when I was in college, I was already interested in history, uh, even in high school, and my favorite president was TR. Uh, I, I won't necessarily say he was the best president we've had, but he was by far and away the most interesting in the end. Uh, he had the most interesting life. Um, and uh, one part of, of uh, um, the subject of fashion that touches on this period is something that, that, that he was not centrally involved in, but he was really interested in. And, uh, I, I'm wondering how many, if any, of you uh, belong to the Audubon Society? You do? Do you? Okay. Do you know how it started? Uh, it's in John Jay Young, Okay, so it's named for the great uh, painter of birds in America. You've all seen, no doubt, uh, some of his paintings, but um, but in the late 19th century, uh, one of the most fashionable things for women was to wear hats that had bird feathers. Uh, often they had the whole bird. Uh, if, you, if you Google bird hats, you will be astonished at, at how gross, actually. So we so, just actually had a professional woman yes. in my house on Friday night working for the sewing ladies, and she talked about cocktails, like whether the term cocktail preceded the feather term for, huh. for wearing cocktail hats, because right. it was like cocktail. Right, so these hats, I mean, they were, and they, they you, you wore them, you know, a, a fashionable, well-to-do woman, the sort of person who would have lived here, probably owned dozens of hats for every different possible occasion. 
uh, and um, they all had bird feathers and um, egrets, herons. Uh, uh, they were all called plumage birds at the time because that's what people cared about was their incredibly beautiful feathers. But in the late 19th century, um, first in Massachusetts and then in a whole bunch of states, and then uh, in the early 20th century, 1901 to 1905, uh, a national organization named in honor of the painter Audubon was founded. Right. And it, its main mission initially was to stop the buying and selling of bird feathers for hats. And it, it was successful. It was overwhelmingly, by the way, a, a movement of women, although there were some prominent men who were involved. Uh, but for men, it was touchy how to be involved because uh, if, you, if you seem to care too much about birds back then, this is also something I've written about, uh, people might say that you were a sissy, uh, or worse. Um, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually wrote a wonderful letter to members of the Audubon soon after he became president that was about his love of birds. But he could get away with saying how much he loved birds and um, that killing birds was, you know, like destroying a symphony or a work of art. Uh, because he was also Mr. Macho. He was the hunter. Uh, no one doubted his manhood. Uh, but it was really women who, who led the way, and they successfully got a law passed in 1901 that banned uh, the buying and selling across state lines of bird feathers. Uh, and, and that pretty much killed the market. Uh, and, and, and most women, uh, well-educated at least, or, or well-to-do women, uh, came to be embarrassed to wear hats like that, uh, even if they could still buy them, they didn't want to. So um, uh, that's one of the first examples, maybe, maybe the first in the United States, of people deciding that a particular kind of fashion um, was, was immoral or was um, deadly and destructive to the environment uh, because it really was endangering these birds. Uh, and in more recent times, um, fur would probably be the, the same thing. Uh, that there's been a campaign now for decades uh, to make it uh, unfashionable to wear fur. Um, what I wanted to talk about is, is broader than that. It's, it's not just going after a particular kind of fashion, um, the fashion for bird hats or the fashion for fur. Uh, it's thinking that fashion itself, um, the constant changing of styles, uh, is, is an environmental disaster. Um, but fashion also is something that we, most of us, uh, care about a lot in some way or another. Uh, there are a lot of things that we like that are stylish. I'm not just talking about clothing. As you'll see, um, in the 20th century, fashion has moved well beyond apparel. Uh, so now you have fashionable cars, you have fashionable phones, you have fashionable lots of things. Um, uh, and I myself actually, uh, until I started to work on this project, I, I really had not thought much about fashion. I, I, I don't have any personal interest in fashion. Um, when I met my wife, uh, she used to joke that, 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 that my um, fashion choices consisted, I, I used to love uh, wearing red t-shirts, of deciding which of the dozens of red t-shirts that I had, I should wear that day. And in her honor, I, I have a red t-shirt on today. Um, as I've gotten older, I, I have um, evolved a little bit in my fashion sense, but nothing like her. I mean, she's a big Project One Way fan. I wouldn't say she tries to keep up with trends, but she definitely likes to look good, which I appreciate. Um, but as I uh, started to think, Years ago in my classes, I really was trying to get students to consider what does history tell us about the, the deepest reasons why we have environmental problems today? Uh, and there are all kinds of reasons that, that we don't have environmental problems for just one reason. Um, and some of them are pretty recent, and some of them go back hundreds of years or even longer. And when I started to think about it, I thought, well, fashion would be on my top 10 list. Uh, and and that really came from putting together two different things that, that even in my field, uh, people hadn't really thought of as being leaked. Uh, so everyone who teaches environmental history t talks about beaver uh, and how the fashion for beaver hats nearly wiped out the beaver in North America, and for that matter, in Europe too. 
Um, but it, it occurred to me that this, the, the, the ultimate story there is the same as the story of uh, what started to be called in the 1950s planned obsolescence. Uh, that, that, that manufacturers started to think about ways that they could get you to buy more stuff. Uh, and one of the ways was to change the style uh, so that you wanted to have the latest. Um, and uh, that really led me to think that fashion is creative destruction. Um, when styles change, no longer stylish things become useless, even if they still are in perfectly good condition. Uh, to avoid embarrassment, the fashion conscious must keep buying into the latest trends. And that potentially endless replacing of the old with the new is a terrible environmental burden. Uh, and and so it's not really obvious why that is, but, but if you think about it, we can only consume so much food, uh, although Americans are constantly trying to prove that's not true. Um, but that's not true about fashionable goods. If people have the money and they have the desire their demand for new looks can be insatiable. Um, uh, when I first wrote about this, I wrote about, um, oh, I'm blanking on her name now, uh, Celine Dion. She had 4,000 pairs of shoes. Uh, and, you know, think how many occasions it would take to wear those shoes, even once. Um, but that's what fashion can do. If you, if you want to have, if you would never want to be seen wearing the same thing again, um, uh, and you can afford it, you can do it. But that's a terrible environmental burden. And of course, like everything else, um, fashion has changed over time, and so has its environmental impact. Uh, until roughly 500 years ago, only the powerful, only um, royalty and um, others like that could own finery. Uh, everyone else had little choice about what to wear. Uh, ordinary folk, might have something special for occasions. Um, their Sunday best would be the probably the simplest example. Uh, but otherwise, they wore the same clothes day after day after day. Uh, and the other objects of life were similarly basic. Most people simply could not afford stylish things. Uh, but two historical developments over the last 500 years have made fashion much, much more environmentally destructive. Um, and the, the first started slowly, uh, but then with a rush in the 20th century was fashion became more democratic. Uh, more and more people could enjoy fashion, could afford fashionable things. Uh, and that's tremendously increased the impact. Uh, when only kings could afford it, even if it was wasteful, it didn't matter that much. Now it does. Um, the other huge change in the 20th century was that the realm of style expanded beyond apparel to include everything now from autos, as I said, to phones. Um, and as a result, I would say fashion is now central to a global economy that's unsustainable. Uh, that one of the drivers of our economy is, is, is this in, in incredible push to something that wastes resources. Uh, and it's a worldwide story, but it's a story that the US is central to. Um, virtually our whole history has been shaped by fashion. Uh, fashion began to shape our landscape in the 17th century, even before we were a nation. Uh, in the 20th century, Americans pioneered essential elements of the modern fashion-driven economy. Uh, and now the United States is one of the centers of a global movement, and this is really interesting to me, to make fashion sustainable, if, if that's possible. It might not be possible. Um, so, I don't want to say too much about the beaver, but um, I want to talk most about the 20th century. But the American colonies were settled when fashion was taking off in Europe. As commerce became critical in the competition among nations, merchants demanded fashionable goods to express their newfound importance to society. Um, the first fashion magazines were already being published in France in the 1670s. Uh, in England, a consumer revolution in the 18th century allowed the well-to-do in the provinces uh, to follow the fashion trends of Paris and London. Uh, and how they did that was interesting, by the way. Uh, it, it took months to get mail um, from some of these places, but you could buy little books 
that had the latest fashions, and if the fashions would stay fashionable long enough that by the time you got the book, it ordered, you know, might be six or eight months, but the fashions would still change. The other, um, and there's a couple of these in the, for, for different reasons in the museum here, um, you could buy uh, life-size cardboard cutouts, uh, and then you could get mail um, of cardboard clothes that you would try on the cardboard cutouts, like the cardboard cutout of TR in the office. Um, so this is already going on um, before the American Revolution. And the speed of fashion kept accelerating as the market grew, as more and more people became um, well enough off to begin to partake. Uh, by the start of the American Revolution, the design of many kinds of apparel changed annually, uh, and some super fashionable items went in and out of style every month. Um, and again, I'll just give one example. Uh, uh, in the early 1600s, the prince in England, one year he bought 60 beaver hats. And uh, each beaver hat cost as much as a horse. I mean, they were expensive. That was part of the point. They were, they were status symbols. Um, the next year he bought another 50. The next year he bought another 40. He was giving them away as gifts, but the point was, he had to keep giving the gifts if he wanted to seem generous because the styles kept changing and last year's hat no longer any good. Um, beaver hats were one of the first great fashions in early modern Europe. Uh, and the fur trade, uh, but especially the beaver trade, had devastating consequences. Uh, beaver were nearly gone from Europe before the colonies were settled. Uh, and then traders began to exploit the beaver in the New World, working relentlessly from the eastern seaboard out to the Pacific. Um, and they continued to trap beaver for hats for 300 years, for three centuries. That's the mind-boggling part to me. Um, uh, and that remade the whole continent. Uh, beavers make dams, they create wetlands and marshes that are habitat for all kinds of other species. Um, and when they were abundant, there were, there were dams everywhere. Uh, apparently, I'm not really an expert on beaver ecology, but apparently the only part, of, only state in the United States that didn't have beaver was Florida. Uh, and I guess that's because they, they couldn't handle the alligators. But even the desert southwest, because it also has mountains, had streams and lakes that were suitable for beaver. Um, by the end of the 300 years, by the end of the 1800s, you, you could hardly find beaver uh, in all of North America, not just the U.S., Canada, too. Um, and uh, when you think about what was lost with the destruction of all those dams as they fell into disrepair without the beaver to keep maintaining them, um, it's almost unimaginable. But I think the moral of the story is easy to miss. Um, if, if beaver hats were a passing fancy, um, for some reason I just uh, thought of uh, something from my childhood, you know, if it was like the yo-yo, um, you might need one, you know, what kid, when I was growing up, wanted to be without at least one yo-yo. But you wouldn't have to buy 50 yo-yos and then buy 50 more the next year, 50 more the year after. Um, they weren't just the range for one season. They were part of the world of fashion for 300 years. And every time styles changed during that time, people had to buy another hat if they wanted to be fashionable. And then another and another and another. The buying might never stop. And again, uh, at first, there really weren't that many fashionable things, and not that many people could afford them. Um, but uh, the empire of styles grew dramatically over time. Um, and in the 20th century, many things that we don't even think as fashion items, many things that we think of as wardrobe basics, became trend-worthy. Um, nylon stockings, for example, came initially only in skin tones. Uh, but when sales dragged in the 1960s, DuPont, which was the only maker of nylon at that point, decided to offer a variety of styles with new colors and patterns and textures every year. So even if you didn't get a run in your stockings, you might want to get rid of them because they weren't fashionable. Um, sneakers, when I was a kid, you know, when I was a kid, there was just Keds. Uh, and if, if you wanted sneakers, you bought Keds. And, you know, until they wore out, they were fine. Um, but uh, manufacturers came to realize that they could enlarge the market by appealing to the style conscious. Uh, if you talk about shoe performance, an LA gear executive said, 
you only need one or two pairs. If you're talking fashion, you're talking endless pairs of shoes. Um, and as I say, the expansion of what could be fashionable went hand in hand with the democratization of consumer culture. Um, now, average Joes and Janes can look put together. Uh, you don't have to be a prince. Uh, and the, the statistics for clothing are pretty astonishing. Americans, on average, buy 65 pieces of clothing a year. That's, that doesn't count like underwear. Um, uh, so if you imagine that for everyone like me who maybe buys three, that means some teenagers are probably buying 100. Um, more than one a week. Uh, and that's way more than a generation ago. And, be, and part of that's because clothing has become unbelievably cheap, uh, so you can afford more of everything. But part of it is also the rise of so-called fast fashion. Um, and uh, when, 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 when I was young, fashion had seasons. You know, There was the summer season and the spring season. Um, now, the fast fashion retailers are introducing new styles with dizzying speed. H&M, um, Forever 21, they have something different every day. Uh, uh, they don't even restock their best sellers. They want customers to think constantly about what's hot now and to feel that if they don't buy it today, they might lose their chance. Um, and uh, if the clothes were expensive, they couldn't get away with that. Shoppers would hesitate before buying something that might look dated in a month. Um, it might look dated before they even wear it. Uh, that's another thing that happens with fast fashion people. Like clothes pile up. Um, apparently, uh, Celine Dion, half her shoes, still have the pads on. Um, but the cheapness of fast fashion encourages impulsiveness. You can binge on the most up-to-date styles. Um, and unlike binging on food or drink, you're not going to get sick or pass out. So you can keep buying new stuff <laughs> as long as you want. Uh, and that has tremendous environmental consequences. Making billions of pieces of clothing, no matter what they're made of, uh, is incredibly environmentally intensive. Um, cotton. Uh, is, is really probably second only to coal uh, among things that are disasters. Uh, it requires tremendous amount of um, water and chemicals and energy to make cotton. Um, but the alternative, artificial fibers, they're all made from non-renewable resources, mostly oil, uh, and in ways that generate a lot of pollution, toxic stuff. Dyeing textiles has always been really gross, a nasty business. Um, and nowadays, it's not just the dots. There are all kinds of other chemicals added to our clothing uh, in order to uh, make them feel soft, or to look bright, or to repel water, or to resist wrinkles and stains. Uh, and because most of our clothing now is made far from where people are buying it, uh, that also means bringing the fashion to market worsens our problem with climate change. Um, there's some indirect effects that are really interesting I had never thought about, but uh, one is uh, having vast wardrobes means uh, you need closets. When people had almost no clothes, they did not need closets. And if you look at 100-year-old houses or more, they, they do not have a lot of closets, if they have any. Um, uh, but nowadays, the typical master closet is about the size of what a guest room was in a house that was built after World War II. And walk-in closets are even bigger. Um, uh, so because old houses often don't meet the storage expectations of today's buyers, uh, that actually, our love of fashion, contributes to suburban fall. It makes it less desirable to buy existing housing stock. Um, and eventually, all this clothing becomes waste. Uh, and I won't, I won't bore you with the statistics, but we throw away literally billions and billions of pounds of textiles every year. Um, it's a huge part of our municipal waste. Uh, and uh, fast fashion especially is not made to last. Why would it be? Um, the colors fade, the seams split apart, uh, the fabric becomes worn after a few washings. Uh, but even if it's still in good condition, people are often going to just discard it um, simply because it no longer excites them. Uh, and for some shoppers, that no regrets trashing of yesterday's styles uh, is, is actually part of the fun. Uh, as one fan of fast fashion said on YouTube, I like things that are disposable. Um, that's actually a scary thought uh, if you care about the environment. If people just threw out unstylish hats, 
or clothes or sneakers, uh, fashion still would be a powerful force of creative destruction. Uh, but what we wear is only part of the problem. Uh, in the 20th century, countless other goods became items of fashion at profound environmental costs. Uh, and that was even true for what used to be called durable goods, things that could last potentially for decades. Um, and one way to think about this, I'm just curious, how many of you own a black car? One, okay, two. Um, that's what I expect. Uh, it, black is not a color that most people choose now. Um, anecdotally, I would say the only exceptions to that are um, really high-end cars. If, if you have a Lexus or a Tesla uh, or a Mercedes, it's much more likely to be black, um, uh, that the black accentuates the idea uh, that this is really high-concept high car. Um, but when cars were first introduced, uh, and initially, except for farmers, the only people that bought them um, in cities were well off. Um, they only came in black. So if I had asked this question 100 years ago, uh, the answer, every hand would have gone up among car owners. Um, that began to change in the 1920s. Uh, and it really signaled a much broader shift in the way people thought about all kinds of goods. Uh, and the, the, the paradigm shifter was GM. Um, GM bet, and, and they, they could have lost everything. If they had been wrong, they probably would have gone bankrupt. Um, but they bet that people would rush to buy more stylish cars if they were available. Um, and they, they introduced annual model changes in 1927. Um, and then in partnership with DuPont, which invented uh, an industrial auto paint, uh, they introduced colors, eye-catching colors. Uh, and both, both of those changes directly challenged Ford. Um, Ford was the biggest company, uh, not just in the US, but in the world. It was the colossus of automaking. Um, and the Model T, the most famous Ford, it only came in black. Uh, eventually, there were different types of Model T, but uh, they didn't have style, and they didn't change every year. They were functional differences. Uh, and in fact, Henry Ford explicitly rejected the idea of redesigning cars to make old models obsolete. Um, in 1922, he proclaimed, our principle of business is precisely the contrary. We cannot conceive how to serve the customer unless we make for him something that, so far as we can provide, will last forever. Um, that's an admirable idea. Uh, but, but he was wrong about what consumers wanted, and GM's bet turned out to be a good one. Um, it turned out well-to-do Americans did not want to look at the same car year after year. They wanted their prized possession to stay sharp. Uh, and by the end of the 20s, GM was overtaking Ford as the number one automaker. Um, and color itself really was a revolution. Uh, it, it's, it's almost hard to imagine now how striking this would have been in a world where the only cars you've ever seen were black. Um, a 1928 magazine ad, so this is really very early, from GM, showed how they sold style at the dawn of the design age. It was called Color Harmonies, and that was in huge print. Like the flaming flowers of spring, uh, the ad depicted a woman picking tulips in front of a Buick. And the greens and the oranges of all the flowers were matched in the car. Buick motor cars wear beauty as radiant as the glowing blossoms of the countryside. Not only the beauty of pleasing lines, but also the beauty of alluring color. Uh, and then it, it gave the names of all these colors. And the names were meant to be poetic. Harbor Blue, Valley Green, Boulevard Maroon, Talena Brown. That one I don't get. Um, all were chosen, the ad said, by color specialists. All are tasteful as well as distinctive, and all combine with Buick's long, low lines to place these cars in the forefront of fashionable creations. So there, there's no ambiguity about that. You don't have to read between the lines. They're saying the car is fashion. Um, it is a fashionable creation. And uh, GM was so successful that by the end of the 20s and the early 30s, people were already saying, um, holy, this is a brand new thing. This is changing the whole economy. 
Um, what has happened, apparently, uh, an advertising executive wrote in 1927, is that many more people have become conscious of style. And the style idea has been extended to many more articles. People buy a new car not because the old one is worn out, but because it is no longer modern. It does not satisfy their pride. That's a really interesting point. Um, you'd be embarrassed to, to drive one of these old things around, even if it still worked perfectly well the way Henry Ford hoped it would. Um, a couple years later, in a text about consumer engineering, because this, this wasn't just by chance, this, this was a marketing move, um, people made a similar argument. This element of style is now a consideration of buying many things. Clothes go out of style and are replaced long before they're worn out. Now that extends to other things, cars, bathrooms, radios, foods, refrigerators, furniture. People are persuaded to abandon the old and buy the new in order to be up to date to have the right and correct thing. Um, if you don't have the right and correct thing, that's bad news. Um, that turned out to be premature. Uh, in the 1920s, even before the Depression, there still weren't enough well-to-do Americans to really remake the whole economy. Um, uh, that really didn't happen until after World War II, uh, in the 1950s, when a majority of Americans, still not all by any means, but a, but a majority, finally uh, got a measure of financial security. Uh, so with money for more than basics, ordinary folks sought consumer goods that demonstrated their new athletes. They, they were so excited to have money uh, that they wanted to display, they wanted to show um, uh, and uh, they also began to value novelty for its own sake. And again, we take this so much for granted, it's hard to imagine when this was still new. Um, but the ability to grow tired of stuff is one of the pleasures of life in an affluent society. You, you can say, I just don't like it anymore. It's just boring, uh, and I'm going to buy another one. Um, you could buy new things just because you felt like a change. And uh, that made the market for fashion vastly greater, even created a whole style that um, one uh, historian of style gave a, a wonderful name, Populux. Uh, that's the title of his book about it. So that's a made up word that combines popular and luxury. Um, you, you know, these folks weren't rich, but they wanted the car to have just enough frills or they wanted to have their clothing to stand out or, to the, or their furniture or their appliances. Um, and again, the automakers were leading the way uh, and this is the great age of gorp, of, of, of metal that was added on just for stylistic purposes, um, of the tail fins. Uh, um, GM, and, and again, they were unabashed about it. GM debuted their new cars every year in something called Motorama that was really like a fashion runway. Um, and each car came out and did its little turn. Um, uh, Ford actually had a, a, a commercial, I can't even imagine this, in the early days of television, two minutes, where they got a, a, an art professor to give discourses about the art, the styling of the cars. Um, and uh, the heads of the style departments of the, of the major automakers, they became just as famous as the Parisian couturiers like um, Christian Dior. Um, uh, Ford's head stylist was known as the Cellini of Chrome, uh, after a famous Renaissance sculptor and artist. Uh, and uh, again, the ads from the 50s really played up the idea of, of fashion, that the newest models were the chicest, uh, and that um, if you wanted to, to be up to date, you needed the styling high. Uh, one of my favorite ads, it goes on and on and on about the style, and then the last line is, and what a dream to drop. Oh yeah, it's actually transportation. It's not just, it's not just an artwork in your driveway. Uh, but this was never just for show. Uh, the automobile makers wanted people to buy cars more often and styling served that good. And again, they were totally upfront about this. Harley Earl, GM's head of styling, the most famous of the stylists, said, our big job is to hasten obsolescence. In 1934, the average car ownership span was five years. Now it's two years. 20 years later. Um, when it's one year, we'll have a perfect score. That's pretty amazing. You know, people are beginning to complain now about buying new phones every year. The automakers were dreaming of having you buy a new car every year. Um, 
Ford's designer said the same thing. We designed a car to make a man unhappy with his 1957 Ford around about the end of 1958. Um, so they were willing to give you two years. And of course, the more successful the stylists were, the worse for the environment. More resources mined, more rivers and skies polluted, more land degraded. Uh, and I, I could go on and on about that, but um, uh, the manufacturing itself was intensively polluting. The incredible amount of what, what materials an average car, 4,000 pounds now, um, getting those materials incredibly destructive. Uh, and then the car at the end of its life. Um, for a while, you know, you might just, they might just be abandoned uh, after the key stuff was salvaged from it. Um, I lived for a while in Kansas, and if you took a canoe ride down the river, you would see all these cars on the river there. Um, most cars back then, after the steel was taken out, because that was really valuable, um, they were just burned, what was left, uh, incinerated. Now they have these gargantuan shredders, um, and they, they turn what's left of the car into, this is the technical term, fluff. Um, but the fluff is highly toxic. A lot of these scrapyards um, are actually now super fun sites because there's so many things in the car that are just getting shredded that are bad for you. Um, uh, and that led to others. Household appliances also became style items. That was much more complicated. People tried in the 20s, uh, and consumers balked. They weren't that interested. Uh, and dealers weren't happy about it either because having all the colors made it harder for them to manage inventory. Um, but in the 50s, they gave in. Uh, and um, actually, uh, the most aggressive of the appliance makers was a subdivision of GM, which there. Uh, but all the others begin to sell style, and they, they start out again with the gork and the designs, and then they try to get you on the idea of getting an integrated kitchen, having every piece combined to make one great artistic fashion statement. Uh, and again, that meant uh, tremendous waste, not just the material, because appliances were even harder to recycle or to reuse for scrap uh, than cars. Most of them just ended up in the landfill, literally buried before their time. Um, the environmental destructiveness of fashion, endlessly changing fashion, didn't go unnoticed. Um, critics of post-war consumer culture started to call America a throwaway society. Uh, and the wastefulness of styling was one of their main targets. Um, Vance Packard's 1960 bestseller, The Waste Makers, was especially powerful. Uh, and he railed against the rise of what he called planned obsolescence of desirability using style to make things undesirable. And the automobile and appliance industries were his most shameful examples. Uh, and interestingly enough, for, for Packard, uh, the cost went beyond wasted resources and despoiled landscapes. He was afraid that the habit of trashing still usable goods ultimately would destroy our, our national character, uh, that it would make citizens self-indulgent, materialistic, weak will. Um, and uh, a few manufacturers began to realize that there was, there was opportunity for them in challenging uh, the, the annual style changes that had become customary. Uh, in the late 1950s, when Detroit overwhelmingly dominated the world market for cars, um, uh, I don't know the figure, but let's say they made 85% of all the cars in the world. It was phenomenal. Um, European automakers, a couple of them, saw an opportunity to break into the market uh, by attacking style. And uh, Volkswagen did this, I think, most cleverly. Oh, Lo Volvo had a wonderful ad, too. They took out an ad in 1959 that showed their cars of the decade. Um, and they were all exactly the same. The 1950 Volkswagen was a black Beetle, and so were the 51, 52, 53, et cetera, all the way up to 59. Um, so the message was pretty clear. The Volkswagen was unfashionable last year. It's unfashionable now. It's going to be unfashionable next year. Uh, but uh, if you still thought a car was something to drive rather than something to show off, uh, you might want to be because it was reliable. Uh, Volvo was, went even further in the 60s. Um, they were incredibly sarcastic in the 1967 ad. Uh, the headline was, the paper car. Um, in a throwaway society, the ad said, the next logical step in planned obsolescence would be disposable cars for every occasion. 
Um, one, you'd, you'd want one car for nights on the town. You'd want another one for <coughs> business meetings. You'd want another one for rides in the countryside. Sounds crazy, says the ad. Yeah, but not much crazier than trading your car in every two years for the latest fashion. That's why Volvos, this is the punchline, were made of steel and built to last. And that worked. Uh, by the end of the 50s, early 60s, uh, uh, these European automakers were beginning to make inroads into the market. U.S. automakers began to dial back some of their styling. Tail fins, for example, start to be embarrassing. Um, and they start introducing compact cars with few frills. Um, and uh, Americans, over time, also start trading in less often. Um, so that uh, by the time of the 2008 um, economic collapse, we were up to average every four years. So twice as often, twice as seldom, in other words, um, as in the heyday of the sky. And it's actually more than that. The crash made people more, more spendthrift. But um, even so, styling is still critical in the auto industry. In fact, a lot of people say the 21st century has been a new golden age of styling. Uh, uh, it's not annual changes, but it's still a major way to try to get you to buy one maker rather than another. Um, and in the economy as a whole, the empire of fashion now stretches further than before. Um, uh, so furniture is a classic example. I'm not going to say much about it. Uh, but furniture used to be something that you know you passed on to the grandkids. You bought it a few times in your life, and you expected to have it last. Uh, now in the age of IKEA, just the opposite. There's, there's nothing that you would buy from IKEA that you'd be giving to your grandkids. Your grandkids. Uh, it's 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 not well built, but it's fashionable. It's stylish. It's designed for everyone. That's actually their slogan. Um, uh, and the consumer appliance electronics field is even more so. Um, and there, uh, the, the, the path breaker was Apple. Um, and people write about Apple exactly the way they, they would have written about Christian Dior. Apple is a fashion designer, one analyst argued. The iPhone and iPad are fashion stages. Another writer called Apple a kind of consumer electronics fashion house with product unveilings akin to Paris couture shows. Uh, and Steve Jobs, when he was running Apple, reviving Apple, um, he really followed the old GM playbook. Uh, the iMac was the first personal computer that you could buy in colors. Um, and uh, styling also came to be critical to Apple's success. Uh, and he debated, actually, when he was first starting out, he, he thought the Beetle was possibly his rock. Um, and then he decided, no, 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 no. Uh, the Porsche uh, is going to be his model. Um, and and they, they, they're, again, they're, they're not hiding this. Um, that they draw directly on the world of high fashion. In 2013, uh, they hired the president of Yves Saint Laurent to help develop wearable technology, you know, watches and other things. Uh, they got the CEO of Burberry to come aboard to make their retail outlets more elegant. Uh, and again, because style now is so much part of our culture, Apple's achievement is easy to take for granted. Um, it's become the world's most valuable corporation by joining fashion and innovation to make products doubly obsolescent. Um, uh, and uh, the, the stylistic features, they're not, they've gone so far beyond uh, the car makers. They don't have dwarf, they don't have added on stuff. Even the most practical parts have to be hip, have to be cool, because coolness sells stuff. Uh, uh, and for many people now, cell phones are, are, are like clothes. You, you can have accessories for your cell phone. You can have um, cool purses for them or covers, and you can uh, uh, decorate them. Um, uh, but people don't get attached to their phones. They throw them out. Um, the structure of the industry encourages discontent, uh, and it works. In 2010, Americans discarded 152 million mobile devices. Uh, and only 11% of that was recycled, collected for recycling. And only a small fraction of the phone is recyclable. Um, so the, the, the waste is not just of the raw materials, but it also, because most of the recycling is done very low-tech ways, 
uh, in developing countries, incredibly dangerous to the environment and to people's health. Um, so fashion, in spite of critics, uh, continues to grow to become a bigger and bigger empire. Um, but there's been a challenge to it. And uh, uh, I'll say more about this if you have questions, but um, the biggest challenge has come in the clothing industry itself. Uh, and I think part of that is because the clothing industry had already been pummeled uh, for sweatshops, for its labor practices. Uh, so they're incredibly sensitive to criticism. Uh, and the criticism from people who are interested in sustainability is, is potentially an existential threat. Uh, that that uh, if fashion is about change and sustainability is about permanence, um, if you decide all you care about is permanence, what's the, what's the place for fashion in that equation? Um, so a, a, a lot of people in the industry, uh, and by that I mean designers, manufacturers, retailers, um, uh, people that teach fashion in schools, um, and for that matter, consumers, are beginning to get interested in sustainability. Uh, and uh, part of what they are trying to do is similar to what a lot of people in the industry are trying to do in all kinds of ways. Um, that you know, using greener materials, reducing waste, finding alternatives to toxic substances in production processes, cutting energy consumption. Um, those are becoming good business practices in many industries, not just clothing. Uh, and, and some businesses are also trying to figure out uh, a lot of the environmental impact of what they make is end of life. What happens to it when the consumer is no longer using it? Um, so they're re-engineering their products to have a lower environmental impact over their life cycle and especially at life cycle. But I think the heart of the sustainable fashion movement is something uh, radically new. People are rethinking the nature of fashion itself. Uh, and, and they're asking a question which to me is the heart of everything. Um, can fashion exist without the environmental damage that comes from throwing out vast quantities of no longer fashionable stuff? Um, the critics of stylistic obsolescence in the 50s and 60s, the people like Vance Packard, they never asked that question. Um, they focused their criticism on durable goods. So they treated style as frivolous. Cars were modes of transportation. Refrigerators were ways of preserving food. Uh, they did not need to be fashionable. Um, though some saw, thought that a civilization built on waste eventually would collapse, uh, I think their deepest anxiety was moral, not environmental. They feared that we were losing our virtue. Uh, the proponents of sustainable fashion, in contrast, aren't simple living moralists. Um, they love to look good. Um, and uh, as an aside, although there are men involved in the sustainable fashion movement, um, just like the campaign against feathers, it's, it's overwhelmingly the, the most famous theorists, the people that teach in schools, um, are, are women. They've given the most thought. Um, they know that this insatiable desire for today's trend is terribly destructive, but they argue that fashion serves important needs. Fashion's a form of self-expression, a tonic against boredom, a way to live in the moment. So they want to develop a fashion ethic for an age of ecological limits. Uh, and they have no illusions about the difficulty of that. Um, they readily acknowledge that sustainable fashion might be a contradiction in terms of it might be an oxymoron. Um, again, if fashion is change and sustainability aims for permanence, can you reconcile them? But they hate the thought that the future might be drab. And they reject what they call fashion minimalism, um, the idea that you can wear the same things again and again and be happy. As sustainable fashion pioneer Kate Fletcher wrote, I love this quote, just as fashion without sustainability is ignorant, Sustainability without fashion is sad. And they've come up with all kinds of interesting ideas uh, for um, how to make products last. And it, it, the challenge isn't making them physically last. It's, it's one of the challenges is what one theorist called emotionally durable design. It's that something that you, you want to keep only. Uh, how can you do that? 
Um, one possibility, for example, is design that encourages customization. If you can imbue something with your own personality, you're more likely to use it longer than if it's just something you got off the shelf. Um, another tactic that people are thinking about is trying to create bonds between the, the maker of the fashionable good and the consumer. Uh, that, that we love stories. If the things we buy come with stories of how they were made and who made them, again, we might be more likely to, to keep them. Um, people also talk about, um, uh, I, I say, um, changing the way we think as consumers. Uh, we truly need to own what we buy. Um, and if you think about the, the many meanings of own, um, that means, as one theorist said, having long-term meaningful relationships with our clothes instead of a series of flings. Um, and they, again, they have lots of ideas about how we might do this. Um, they encourage us to come up with our own sense of style uh, and uh, build a wardrobe around a few well-made pieces rather than a lot of trendy stuff. They also encourage do-it-yourself <coughs> skills. If you can mend things, they'll last longer. If you can refashion them when they become unfashionable yourself, um, that gives a profound sense of ownership. Um, and uh, I, I think that's interesting. The do-it-yourselfer is giving something uh, instead of the traditional consumer who's just taking, taking, taking. Um, even uh, the most thoughtful, sustainable fashion people acknowledged that powerful cultural and economic forces stand in the way of reform. Um, the call to take responsibility for our possessions, for example, that goes against the whole grain of modern consumer culture, which promises freedom. That, 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 I mean, in a way, that's, that's what the disposability is. We don't have to care about any of this stuff. It's just gone, We're not thinking about it again. Um, so giving that up, that convenience, that disposability, isn't going to be easy. Um, marketers are also constantly stimulating our desire for new things. Uh, though novelty can simply be a pleasure, it's become a source of discontent. Uh, and again, that's on purpose. Manufacturers and retailers decided, uh, starting with the car makers, that that was one of the great advantages from their point of view of stylistic obsolescence. As GM's um, Charles Kettering said, their motto was, keep the consumer dissatisfied. Um, but a growing number of consumers are beginning to change, and they're doing this in all kinds of ways, um, ranging from um, sewing, learning to sew again. There's actually been an explosion since 2000 in the number of people taking sewing class and the number of people buying sewing machines. Um, they're not going to sew all their clothes, but, but uh, for some at least, it's a way of, of rejecting this throwaway society and being able to make things that you'll really be proud to own. Um, clothing swaps have become common. Like, some of these are really simple. Some of them are fancy parties. Um, but you have to bring something that you're going to give away, and then you get to take something that someone else has brought. So that extends the life. It, it takes uh, us away from buying more and more and more. Um, even fashion timeouts are getting attention. Uh, and the goal is not to stop buying clothes forever. Uh, it actually reminds me a lot of Henry David Thoreau's uh, sojourn at Walden that it's their experiments to see um, what truly suffices for a satisfying life. How, how much stuff do you really need? How often do you need to buy new things? Um, and, and a lot of people have done really creative things, uh, experiments that way. Uh, and it's, it's catching on, at least in some parts of the business world. Um, Patagonia, uh, although they only make uh, outdoor apparel, um, they have really worked in all kinds of ways to try to slow down consumption. Uh, and most famous was an ad that they took out on a, on a Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, busiest shopping day of the year. Full page ad in the New York Times with their most popular jacket, and they said, don't buy this. You know, think twice before. And it went on and on about all the ways in which the cycle of buying and throwing away, and getting bored and buying more, um, damages the environment. Uh, will any of this be enough? Uh, even the most ardent advocates of sustainable fashion acknowledge that the movement still has a long way to go. Um, I think they've actually underestimated in some ways the challenges ahead if you look at history. Uh, but um, but I, and I can say more about the questions that I have if you're interested. But I, I think 
Um, they don't negate the questions about whether this is possible, uh, the importance of what people are trying to do. Uh, abolishing fashion seems more and more a utopian dream. Style no longer matters just to the elite. Uh, in the 20th century, fashion became fundamental, and almost everyone now derives some pleasure from stylish things. Though sustainable fashion might prove an oxymoron, what's the alternative? Thank you. Be happy to answer any questions that you have.